All right, let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, if you would. Mark chapter 9, and let me uh, correct an announcement. The teen meeting for the teens for the camping will be in the Family Life Center. So it'll be in the Life Center for this evening. So just a correction there. Mark chapter 9, we're continuing our series in the exposition of Mark, the Gospel of Mark. And today, the title of the sermon is Moving from Failure to Victory through faith and power. Um, I'm going to read to you some epigrams, some short little sayings, concise sayings on uh, the topic of faith. A few of these, they really stir me up, so just listen carefully in regards to faith. Faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. Here's another one. Faith is idle when circumstances are right, Only when they are adverse is one's faith in God exercised. Faith, like muscle, grows strong and supple with exercise. Here's another one. Don't be afraid to take a big step if one is indicated. You can't cross a chasm in two small jumps. That's by uh, David Lloyd George. A little faith will bring your soul to heaven. A great faith will bring heaven to your soul. That's Charles Spurgeon. Faith is not believing that God can, but that God will. And lastly, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. That should sound familiar. Jesus said it, and we're going to see it in the text this morning. And if you can remember last week, we were on the Mount of Transfiguration. In the text this week, we'll be in the valley. We'll come down from the mountain. We're going to learn on how we can move from failure to victory through faith, through prayer. Last week, we were on the Mount of Transfiguration, and we saw the great lawgiver, Moses. We saw the great prophet, the one who called down fire from heaven, the one who was taken up to heaven by a chariot of fire. We saw Elijah and Moses. We saw the radiant brightness of a transformed Jesus in all his glory. We saw the Shekinah glory come upon the mountain, the Shekinah that hadn't been in Israel for over 600 years. That was a mountaintop experience. And most of us know you can't always stay on the mountaintop. You can't always have the spiritual high. You have to come down sometime. And so Jesus and the three disciples come down from the mountain. It's likely that they've, gone for at le- they've been gone for at least two days, one to climb up the mountain, one to come down. It's possible also they've been gone for more than that. But they come down from the mountain and they meet failure. There's such a contrast that we'll see in the text today. The glory of the divine on the mountain and then the darkness of demon possession in the valley. We'll go from the blessed company of great men to the noise of unbelieving scholars or scribes. We'll leave the voice of God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him, to the voice of a despairing Father saying, If you can do anything, help us. We shall see failure in the valley of testing. Now, if you can remember, the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, coming down from the mountain full of faith, in contrast to the nine disciples at the bottom, their their faith is weak. Their faith is powerless. This week, I was just meditating and thinking through, why would Jesus always take these three, Peter, James, and John? He took them into the room to heal Jairus' daughter. He took them up to the Mount of Transfiguration, just those three. And he took just those three into the Garden of Gethsemane as well. And I thought through it, and I think, personally, I think this is why. Not only for uh, training, you know, he's going to train people who will be able to teach others also, or mentoring, but also for eyewitness testimony. But lastly, I think these three had the greatest faith among the twelve. And why do I say that? I say that because, remember remember I said those men were always uh, industrious. They're business owners. They're forceful. They're, 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 They're aggressive in that sense. James and John called the sons of thunder because one town didn't believe, and so they asked Jesus to 
if they could call down fire to destroy the village. Jesus said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are. But they were intense. And it was James and John's mama who approached Jesus and said, can, uh, can my son sit next to you in the kingdom, one on the right and one on the left? You know, they're, they're spiritually ambitious. They believe, that's why. And then remember Peter. In the boat, in the storm, Jesus walking on the water, and he says, Jesus, if it's you, bid me to come. Jesus says, come. Peter walks on water. That's faith. Only for a couple of steps, probably, but it is faith nonetheless. And I think that's why he chose the three, because they had great faith. Now the nine in the valley, they had weak faith. Remember, all these disciples now for about two years have been walking with Jesus. They've been walking by sight. They've seen him. Uh, John would say, you know, our, 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 we touched him. We heard him. We knew that he was the son of God, full of grace and truth. But they walked by faith, or actually they walked by sight and not by faith while Jesus was present upon the earth. After his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension, they would have to remember all of the times and all of the teachings that he taught them when he would ascend into heaven. The Holy Spirit would help them to remember, of course. So Jesus would not be physically present with them. They would have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. This is the lesson that they would learn through this situation, the testing in the valley. So let's enter into their story in Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14, and I'll read to verse 22. Mark 9, 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I've, I've brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wherever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. I spake to thy disciples, thy disciples, that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came upon him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So I want you to understand the purpose of the text this morning. The purpose of the text this morning, I believe, is to teach the apostles, to teach the followers of Christ that faith is essential in Christian ministry. Faith is essential in your walk with God, in your spiritual walk and power. So they're in the valley of difficulty here. And they're going to have to move, especially the nine disciples, from failure to faith. And Jesus will teach them that it's through prayer and fasting but we see the preliminaries here in verses 14 to 16. Just to summarize the scene again, Jesus finds nine of his disciples arguing with some scribes or teachers of the law. So the scene is chaotic here. There's nine disciples. There are a few antagonistic scribes. There's a large crowd. There's a despairing father, and there's a demon-possessed boy. And according to Luke 9:38, this is this man's only child. This is what the devil was doing in the valley while Christ was on the mountaintop. Christ is building up faith. The devil is destroying faith. We learn that the disciples were, in essence, in double trouble. They were unable to cast out a demon out of a demon-possessed boy. And the scribes were arguing with them, debating with them, perhaps even taunting them because of their inability to cast out the demon. And as always, Jesus steps in to solve the problem. What problem? What are the particulars of this problem? We see a couple of victims here. We see a helpless father and a hopeless son. A desperate father. 
He tells Jesus that his disciples were unable to cast the devil out of this, his son. Now, this is conjecture, and I, I think I, this is what I believe, okay? So this is not gospel truth, but I believe that this was staged. Um, I believe this was part of a plot from the scribes with this man until this man has a change of heart in the middle of the text, but I believe this was staged. He probably first went to the scribes. The scribes couldn't do it. Then he probably took, took them to the disciples, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't cast out the demon. Now, if you notice in the text, Jesus asked the scribes. He asked the scribes in verse 16, what question you with them? He's talking to the scribes at this point. But the father jumps in to answer. And then a little later on, he says with great doubt, if you can, heal him. So I, I don't think that he is, he's got good intentions at the beginning. His initial t attitude is an attitude of doubt back in verse 22. So we have a helpless father and now a hopeless son. And the source of this son's problem is, is, is that he's demon-possessed. The symptoms of his problem is that, that the, this evil spirit, this unclean spirit, throws the boy in violent fits, causing epileptic-like seizures. And if you can imagine, here's this boy with burns all over his body. At points in his life, the, the demon tried to throw him into the water to be drowned or hot water or whatever it was. And so this, this boy has been possessed since childhood, according to verse 20 to 22. How long has this been? And Jesus asked the question, how long? Jesus is omniscient. He knows how long. But I believe Jesus asked the question to give room for the man to express his pain. That Jesus might be able to empathize with him. And so he's a young man now. And he's been demon-possessed since he was a child. And the stakes are raised because this is an only child. And so you can see the father's desperation. And if you can imagine the state of the son. He's deaf and mute. It's like uh, living in a fishbowl, only you can't talk. You can see everything. But you can't communicate, and you can't even control your body at times. And so this boy is in trouble, anguish. And if you remember, Satan is called the God of this world. The Apostle John says that this entire world is in the lap of Satan and the control of the wicked one. <clears throat> and if you could just remember this thought, that the devil is trying to destroy humanity. Satan is trying to destroy the image of God in man. He marred that image with sin or the temptation to sin in the Garden of Eden. So the image of God has now been marred in man by sin, with sin. He, I think Satan has been indirectly attacking God by attacking the image of God in man. If you remember the promise of Genesis 3.15 that there would be two seeds, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, the seed of the faithful and the seed of the serpent, those who will follow the serpent. Satan is trying to destroy man and any possibility of man following the true God. The devil wants to get a hold of young lives. Why? So that he might destroy them. I read this week in uh, an Associated Press article back from when I was in high school, back in 1988. I was a junior. And there was an article in the Wisconsin State Journal about a 14-year-old boy named Thomas Sullivan. He was told to do a report on religions. So he did a report on religions, and he started studying Satan worship. Within two weeks, this boy, who was normally a studious boy, and um, he was in depth studying Satan worship, he ended up stabbing his mom to death, setting his own house on fire to kill his father and brother, and then he slit his own wrist in his own throat and died in the bloody snow. And this is just a couple of weeks. Satan is after young souls. Jesus said it in this way, false teachers, you know, driven by satanic forces, they come to their thieves. They come to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life, and life more abundantly. So not only does Satan try to destroy young lives, young individual lives, 
through occult worship, through drugs, through immorality. He's also done it by influencing the next generation in public education. Just think of how public education has changed since you and I have been in high school. Just think about it. In the last 55 years, last 30 years for me, how much it's changed. And I came across an article, I think it's significant for you to understand, the attack, the spiritual warfare that Satan has upon the youth, upon the next generation. This is an article by, uh, printed August 15, 2014 by Penny Starr in the cnsnews.com website here. It says this, Education expert William Jane said on Wednesday that there is a correlation between the decline of U.S. public schools and the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in 1962 and 63, decisions that school-sponsored Bible reading was unconstitutional. And he goes on to say, One can argue, and some have, that the decision by the Supreme Court in a series of three decisions back in 1962 and 63 to remove the Bible and prayer from our public schools may be the most spiritually significant event in our nation's history over the course of the last 55 years. On June 25, 1962, the United States Supreme Court decided in Engel v. Vital that a prayer approved by the New York Board of Regents for use in public schools violated the First Amendment because it represented establishment of religion. In 1963, in Abington School District versus Shemp, the court decided against Bible readings in public schools along the same lines. Since 1963, Jaynes, the educator, said that there have been five negative developments in the nation's public schools. One, academic achievement has plummeted, including SAT scores. Two, increased rate of out-of-wedlock births. Three, increased use of illegal drugs. Four, increase in juvenile crime. Five, deterioration of school behavior. He goes on to say, so we need to realize that the actions do have consequences. Said this professor, Jaynes, from California State College in Long Beach. He said, when we remove that moral fiber, that moral emphasis, this is what can result. Other facts included comparison between the top five complaints of teachers from 1940 to 1962. Right, here's the top five complaints. Talking, chewing gum, making noise, running in the halls, and getting out of turn in line. Now it's rape, robbery, assault, burglary, and arson from the 1963 to the present. So do you see how serious the spiritual warfare is going on for the hearts of the young? And that article is three or four years old. And so now, what do we have in public education? We have their health curriculum saying, hey, try, try out being a lesbian. You don't know. You might be one, so try it. Try it homosexual, homosexuality. You don't know. You might be one, so try it. Here, here's free condoms, safe sex. God has a safe sex program. It's called marriage. One man, one woman for life. There is a spiritual warfare going on for the hearts of our youth. I hope you understand and realize that. You know, even today, even, public colleges, pub, two public universities that I'm aware of, have a, have a bathroom sign for transgender people. One has half, half a dress on a lady and half a man. That's how far it's gone. And you know what that is? That is an attack on the very identity of what God created. In the image of God created he, him, male and female created he, them. That's an attack upon human identity, the image of God and man. That's what's going on. There is spiritual warfare. And let me do... Let me do uh, we need to reach children when they're young. I'm going to take an informal poll here. If you became a Christian at the age of 19 or younger, raise your hand. The age of 19 or younger. Okay? So about 60 to 70% here of the congregation. That's how serious it, is, serious it is for us to reach the young. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we do VBS. That's why we do Bible studies. That's why we do what we do. Jesus said that he's the life giver. Satan is the life destroyer. 
Now, what was the answer to this demon-possessed boy? The answer was found in verse 19. You know what Jesus says? Bring him to me. That's the answer. Bring him to Jesus. So we have the helpless disciples here in verses 18 and 19. They're powerless to help. We have the scribes who I think, again, set set this whole situation up. When Jesus, I want to I want to give you something that will help you to understand, I think, what's going on here. When Jesus commissioned his disciples, turn back with me to Mark chapter 6. Look at Mark 6, verse 6 and 7. In Mark 6, verse 6 and 7, he has chosen the 12. And he's given, this, given them this commission. And it, look at verse 6, Mark 6, 7. 6, 6 and 6, 7 says, And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around about the villages teaching. So Jesus was doing that by himself. He was the one giving an example. He was leading, and now he was going to commission the, the 12 apostles. Look at verse 7. And he called unto him the 12 and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits. That's what we have right now in our text. Only that they didn't have power over this unclean spirit. So at one point in time, when Jesus is telling them to preach the kingdom, to cast out demons, and he told them, only preach to Israel, do not preach to the Gentiles. So he gives them this commission, and with this sign following that you can cast out demons. Now look at verse 13 of Mark 6. In, in verse 13 it says, And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. So they had the power and they actually did cast out demons with this commission. But now turn to Mark 8 and look at verses 11 and 12. Jesus now has been ministering. He's been performing all types of miracles, confirming his Messiahship. But there is a time when he will no longer give signs. And we see that. Look at Mark 8, verse 11 and 12. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why did this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. So the signs are done. His own signs And I I believe now the commission as signs to Israel because they as a nation and as leadership, the scribes and Pharisees, have rejected Jesus and no more signs will be given. So I'm thinking this is partly the reason why why the disciples don't have this authority to cast out this demon. That's partly the reason. Jesus refuses to give any more signs. He, he takes and spends time individually with his disciples now to train them for what is to come. He's going to train them about faith. He's going to train them about children. You're going to have to come to the kingdom with, with faith as a child. He's going to train them. He's no longer going to be giving signs to the Israel because they've rejected him already. And so now we have intensive training, especially with the three on top of the Mount of Transfiguration, and I think it's, imp- it's possible now that the disciples could not cast out demons anymore under that commission because the commission had been rescinded. No more signs. Because of the national rejection of, the, uh, of Jesus and his message. So I believe on this occasion, Jesus performs this sign to teach his disciples that Christian ministry is no longer going to be based on the commission that I gave you to the Jews, to Israel. It's going to be based on faith. A walk with me. I won't be around anymore. You will no longer walk by sight. I will no longer be physically present. You will have to walk by faith. They would have to now have power based on faith and prayer and obedience. And partly, what's going on with the scribes, the religious teachers, now debating, taunting, and arguing with the disciples, there was an expression back then that went something like this, as the rabbi, so the pupil. In other words, I think what the scribes are doing is trying to discredit Jesus and the disciples by saying, you can't cast out this demon because you're a phony, and so is your teacher. To discredit Jesus and the message. And so Jesus, 
allows this sign not to Israel, but to the apostles to teach them now it's not based upon the commission, it's, pa- it's based upon your walk of faith with me, your connection with me through prayer and obedience. That's where the power is going to come from. So the disciples here, they meet a case that's too hard for them. And you know what they're learning? They're learning the truth of John 15, 5. And you know it. Without me, you can do nothing. I'm no longer going to be physically present, so you're going to have to stay connected with me by faith, stay in union with me, by abiding, by obeying, then you will have power. Sometimes the lessons that we learn by hard knocks, by hard experience, they last longer than the lessons we just hear by the hearing of the ear, right? It goes out one, goes in one ear, out the other. But when you learn the hard way, like they're learning now, they're learning, oh, we have to walk by faith. Can you imagine the nine disciples going, here, here, let me get a shot at this guy. You know what? Be out. Be gone, demon. And it's not happening. Nine times, probably, it doesn't happen. But then Jesus comes. You know, just when evil looks like it's about to triumph, Jesus appears, and the victory comes. And how? how, What's the answer to this demon boy's possession problem? Bring him to me. Now let's look at the verse, the next verse, Mark 9, 23, if you would. Turn back to Mark 9, 23. Jesus said unto him, you know, after, this is after the Father says, you know, if you can. And Jesus is essentially saying, if I can, that's not the issue. The issue is not my ability. The issue is your faith. So let's look at verse 23. If thou canst believe, this is Jesus speaking, all things are possible him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I think this is where he crosses over from the collusion with the scribes to genuine faith. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. Again, no more public ministry, no more public signs. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask. So moving from the valley of difficulty, learning that victory comes through faith and prayer, we have the divine solution. Come, bring him unto me. And the sign to the apostles is, from now on, Your ministry is going to be based not on my commission of casting out demons and the preaching of the kingdom, but it will be based on faith and prayer. You're going to have to remain connected to me. I will be physically gone. And he reminds them by the end of our text this morning, he reminds them again, I'm going to be killed. I'm not going to be around. You're going to have to learn to live by faith and not by sight. And so Jesus here reassures the Father back in verse 23, anything is possible if you can believe. And again, in effect, he says, look, my ability is not the issue, it's your faith. That's the issue. And the Father, like all of us, imperfect faith, I believe. You know, if you can imagine the faith scale, right? Strong faith, unbelief at the other end. I believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus still uses imperfect faith. And by that we can be encouraged. This is what we call a a promise, right? If you can believe, a faith promise, sometimes a prayer promise. This verse can be abused if taken out of its context. This is not teaching that, you know, just like Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ. You, you, you've probably seen, I've seen in weight rooms where that verse is, is above a weight bench, right? And so this guy is trying to, I can do all things. I can bench 250. That is not, 
the context of the verse. That's not what it means. The danger in taking this verse out of context is you, you can wreck somebody's faith. Let me give you some examples. I want you to understand that faith cannot go farther than what God's word clearly teaches. That is, the promises of the word, the promises, prayer promises, should be understood in the, count, in, in the whole counsel of God, in the context of the whole counsel of God. For instance, you know, I can whip up great faith, and I can say, I believe, God said it, all things are possible to him that believes, I believe that I can win this $100 million lottery. So I'm going to buy a, a lottery ticket every day for the next year, and I believe one of these days, because of God's promises, that I will win, and I will tithe, Right? So he, he, a person is reasoning in his mind, taking a verse out of context and applying it to the situation. Does that situation apply to this verse? The answer is no. Because that's not what God is saying. That's not what God's will is. Example two, more personal and more hurtful. You have a family member who has a terminal disease. You claim all the prayer promises, the health promises of the Bible. And you work up great faith saying, I know that God will either save me from a terminal disease or my loved one from a terminal disease. Is that how this verse is applied? No. God is not guaranteed that that person will be healed, but guess what? He may. There's that other extreme, right? This extreme of unbelief. There are hard cases where you say, that person is never going to become a Christian. He is way out there. He is depraved. His mind is gone. He's filthy in his mouth. He's filthy in his mind. And we think, God can never save that person. You know what? God can save murderers, persecutors. He saved the Apostle Paul from killing Christians. If we have unbelief to the other extreme, that is also sin. If we take the promise out of its context to one extreme, that is also sin. So what is our attitude? Our attitude is faith believing. It's also faith yielding and submitting. James said it in James 4.15. He said, For you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But I'm going to pray, Lord, if it's your will, heal. That's the idea, an attitude of, of, of yieldedness and submission. So yes, there is a promise here. If you can believe all things are possible to him that believes... And the struggle for faith, as we all struggle, that imperfect faith, the Father says, I believe, help my unbelief. And Jesus can work with imperfect faith because he does. Jesus rebukes the demon, he leaves him, and Jesus says, get out of him and never return. And what happens? That's exactly what happens. And Jesus restores the son, and he takes the boy by the hand and lifts him up. That's reaching the next generation for Jesus Christ bringing them to faith in Christ. So privately, after this whole situation, as I wrap it up here, the disciples, you know, in a closed-door setting, they ask the question, why, why couldn't we cast him out? And it seems, okay, that they were relying on their, great commi or their commission from Mark 6, 7, as we read. Also, They were not walking by faith. Jesus answers, you know, Israel had rejected him. He had rejected further signs to Israel. No more signs shall be given unto you. But this sign, I think, is performed for the purpose of the disciples, to teach them to walk by faith and by prayer. By the way, the commission is reinstated for apostolic authority a little later on at, towards the end of our Gospels. They'll preach him as Lord and Savior and have authority over demons. A 
again. But Jesus says in verse 29, here's, here's the answer. Okay, why, why, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? He says this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. He had been away from his disciples again for at least two days. One day to climb up the mountain, one day to climb down the mountain. And depending on where the disciples were, if they were back at Caesarea Philippi, which is a two-day trip, um, it could have been more than two days, maybe four or five. So they're gone. The nine disciples have to deal with trouble without the sight of Jesus close by. And again, I think the main lesson is that the power of faith to overcome failure comes from that close relationship with God, that prayer dependence, that prayer, that connectedness with God, that they would have to walk by faith and not by sight. And that faith has to be cultivated by spiritual discipline and devotion, by prayer and fasting. Fasting is just a prolonged period of time that increases your intensity of prayer and focus. So it is by prayer. It is by maintaining that relationship and that connection and that dependence so that you can have power. Now here's an Old Testament example of just this. Remember Samson and Delilah. You know the story. He has his hair. His hair symbolizes his devotion and his consecration to God. Samson becomes more and more worldly and ungodly. He's sleeping around. He, he's, he's, he's doing all these things that the world does, and he begins to lose his power, and one day his hair is cut off and his power is cut off, symbolizing the power is cut off when the connection, the devotion, the prayer life is cut off. If you don't have power in your Christian life, it's because you're not praying. That's what he's saying. The power to cast out this kind comes by prayer, by connection, by devotion. So they're all on a spiritual high. Yeah, he's done it again. It's been a while since he's cast out a demon publicly. He's done it again, and they're on a spiritual high. There's a state of euphoria. They're all excited, and, you know, they're up here. You know what Jesus does? Let me remind you, this doesn't change anything. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed, but I'll rise again. He's reminding them again, I'm not going to be with you forever on this earth physically. So you'll have to walk by faith and not by sight. And the evidence of your walking by faith is your power to do what he would have you to do in life. And that power is manifested through a prayer saturated life with God. So he reminds them that in verses 30 to 32. Look, I'm going to be gone. I have to remind you strongly this is the future that you're going to face. You're going to have to walk by faith. And so as I close right now, there are two invitations. One to the believer. You're invited to dedicate your life to a life of faith and devotion. One of the indicators of your walk with God is your prayer life. A true test of your spiritual walk is your prayer life. A life of prayer is a life of power with God and with men. And that faith, demonstrated by that prayer dependence upon God, is going to manifest itself. You know, there's the faith that saves. You've agreed with God that you're a sinner. You repented from that sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ. That is the faith that saves. There's the faith that supplies. You say, I don't have the resources I need. Remember what Jesus said? Seek first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The faith that saves, the faith that supplies, there's the faith that stands. I know what God says about marriage. I know what God says about, about religion and faith. I know what God says about politics. I know that politics cannot save. I know it's the gospel that will make America great again, not politics. I know and I can stand on that because it's a faith that stands on his truth. That's what you're invited to. You're invited to a faith that serves. 
If you're truly saved, you're going to be so grateful that you will serve God somehow. Through your time, through your talent, through your treasures. And then there's a faith that sings. Why do I sing? Because I'm happy. Because I have the joy of the Lord. It is my strength. People see and know that there's something different about me because I know God. The second invitation If you're here today, you don't know what it means to be a Christian. If you're here today and you know that if you died, you're uncertain about where you'd go. You need to lay hold of Jesus Christ. You need to exercise the faith that saves. Agree with God that you're a sinner. Turn from that sin. Like you're sitting in your chair right now. You're trusting everything that you are in the chair to hold you up. That's what needs to be done. You have to turn from sin, put everything that you are trusting in Jesus Christ, that he died for you in your place for your sin. He was buried and that he rose again the third day. And then you start walking by faith. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the grace that we have in Jesus. Thank you for even the faith to believe. Lord, I pray for every one of us that we would maintain the power in our Christian lives by an attitude, by a spirit, by a discipline of prayer. Help us to see your power in our lives. Lord, I think of the ministry this week as we seek to win the lost, the young, to Jesus Christ, that you would open up the the doors of their heart that they might understand and believe. Lord, I pray for your blessing on the preaching of the gospel this week and the salvation of the lost, both the children and their families. Father, I pray for Believers in here to walk by faith in all those areas, by service, by the faith of supplies, by standing, by singing, that we would live lives that glorify you, for without faith it's impossible to please you. Help us to please you with our walk of faith. And for those who are not believers, open their eyes that they might see the need for repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me encourage you, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, talk to me, talk to one of the ushers. We'll set up a time to speak and talk to you and show you from the Bible itself on how you can be sure that you could be saved. And let me encourage you this week, walk by faith. I'm believing that God's going to give you an opportunity to witness somehow, to talk to somebody about spiritual things. And when it comes up, somebody in here, it'll come up with somebody, tell me about it. Tell somebody else about it, because I know it probably will come up. All right, at this time, please stand with me, and uh, Brother Steve is going to lead us into the doxology.